It's nice to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, been trying to get in better shape. That was my New Year's thing that I was gonna do. Because I feel like no matter how many hikes I do or how many green smoothies I drink, I still got this Ted Cruz neck. And it's really frustrating, you know what I mean? Because I'm a nice dude, I'm a forward-thinking dude, but I'm a southerner already, so that's like a strike against me. I don't want people seeing this neck and being like, that dude's a racist, you know what I mean? Because like all the shitty dudes got this neck, like Ted Cruz got this neck, you know what I mean? Rush Limbaugh got this neck, fucking Sean Hannity's got this neck. Mike Huckabee, Sarah Huckabee, the president, they all got this neck. Ivanka's neck coming in, you know? It's like a neck tangle. It's like a bigot neck. And I don't want people to be like, look, it's fucking bigot neck. Are you sure about him? You know what I mean? I don't ever want anybody to think I'm a bigot. People are still people are still bigots, man. People are trying to like behead people for having abortions now and shit. When people do people start trying to have those conversations with me because they hear my accent, I'll just out southern them. I'll be like, yeah, abortion's a real shame. That's why I like gay people. I'm like, what? I'm like, gay people get less abortions than any other group of people. <laughs> <laughs> only thing I like about the gays hardly ever get abortions. <laughs> only thing I like about people get abortions hardly ever get. You know what I mean? It's like a catch twenty six. <laughs> Ridiculous, man. People are still racist. We told them not to. They're still doing it. It's very frustrating. It's, uh, it's unbelievable to me that they're, they're white supremacists in the United States of America. It's the most ethnically diverse society in human history. And these dudes are like, it's a white country. Like, no, it's not, dog. Every large city in the United States has a China inside of it. You should leave your road. Put a little extra gas in your four-wheeler. Go to another road. Have a look around. It's crazy. That's like our whole shtick. We're the melting pot. It's our whole fucking thing. But if you Google us, it's on the top five on our Wikipedia page. You know what I mean? It's like baseball, titties, bald eagles, hot dogs, melting pot. It's in the top five. Oh, sorry. Just making sure. I think the only way we're going to defeat racism is to beef up our foreign lang language programs in the schools. You know, and I know that might be a little bit controversial. Some people won't be into that, so let me clarify. I'm not saying that the kids should take more foreign language. That's not what I'm advocating. I'm saying keep everything the way it is, but really teach these kids how to say really common words correctly. Because it's hard to be a racist when you're saying shit right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You can't be like, man, I'm gonna go to the clan meeting as soon as I finish this kid. Like, you can't. It's hard. It's hard. I wish I was fucking Mexicans would get out of San Antonio. Like, I can't do both. I think if you are a racist, you should have to put that shit on your driver's license. Just like organ donor. Except the other way around. In case you need an organ. We don't want you to get the wrong one. Right? Can you see the nurse coming in? Like, uh, looks like we got a heart for Mr. Williams. Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Williams. I didn't see that you're a racist. <laughs> you wouldn't want this heart. It's not as good as yours. <laughs> you're going to be fine. Just keep doing this. Just keep doing this. You're going to be fine. I don't want you to get the wrong one. People, people, uh, this is a set I've never done before, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm very funny. Uh, I normally do 60 minutes, so I'm trying to cram, cram it into five. Uh, all right, we'll just do this. Uh, so my, my sister is gay, and so my mom talks in tongues. And, and my sister does too, kind of, really, if you think about it. It's been, a, it's been a very interesting thing in my family, a very interesting dynamic, and it, it really changed my family. And my sister came out to me when I was 15. I was, I was shit-faced, and I called her, and I, I kind of, like, coaxed it out of her. You know what I mean? Because I was, remember when, like, the first few times you got drunk, and you feel just, like, euphoria, you feel, like, warm and fuzzy, and you want to tell everybody you love them, and it's just so much fun, and you're giggling, 
and then you spend like the next 30 years trying to recreate that in Japan. <laughs> and now you're just an alcoholic. You know what I'm saying? You guys all know. You all know. Well, it was one of the first times when it was still enjoyable. And so I was like, I'm shit faced. And so my, my sister called to talk to my parents, and, the, and they put her on the phone with me. And she was like, Mom and Dad think that you're on drugs. And I was like, well, I'm not yet. And uh, <laughs> and she was like, I told him that you're just being silly because you're with your friend, whatever. So then I just was like, fuck it, I'm going for it. Because I thought that she might be gay. Like me and my brother had been talking about it. We thought she might be. And because she had a Subaru. And uh, <laughs> so, that wasn't the only reason, but that was one of the, th that was one of the things. And so I just told her, I was like, hey, I just want you to know I love you no matter what. And she was like, well, I love you no matter what, too. I was like, yeah, but I, I love you, like, no matter what. <laughs> She's like, I love you no matter what. And I was like, yeah, but no matter what, I love you no matter what. And I, I told her about, about 900 times. And then, so finally she was like, are we talking about the same thing? And I was like, yeah, Subaru. And she, was like, <laughs> and she started crying, and I started crying. And, and, and she, she came out to me and she was like, it feels so good for somebody in the family to know because nobody else in the family knew at that time. And, uh, and it really strengthened our bond. My sister my sister is like such an amazing human being. But we kept that secret for nine more years. Because uh, cause we thought we had to, you know. And one day, as I was 24 years old, she's 11 years old than me, she called me over to her house and she handed me a two page letter and she said, I'm mailing this to mom tomorrow. And I begged her not to, because uh, cause I'm not as brave as she is. And I knew that it was, it was gonna change my family, and it did. And, uh, and they didn't disown her, because that's a very specific word with a very specific definition, and that's not what they did. But, but they shunned her, and they judged her, and they let her know that they didn't approve of her life and her family more than they needed to, every chance they got. And it was a really powerful, heavy, emotionally damaging thing for my sister. But when my dad got sick with brain cancer, um, this is gonna get funny in a second. Um, <laughs> you guys are like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is sad. <laughs> when my dad got sick with brain cancer, they called my sister and she dropped fucking everything. She stepped through all that pain and that shame and that resentment and that judgment, all that heavy emotional shit, she stepped through it she dropped everything, her kid, her family, her work, and she drove from six hours away and she sat with that dying man all day, every day, until his last day, and she showed him unconditional love. And it's the most Christ-like thing I've ever seen anybody do in my life. And that's why it's such a bummer that she's going to hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs>